All right, uh, this is the second lecture. So we're going to continue with the discussion of rotational motion and rigid body dynamics. Um, so let's just review uh, some of the things we did um, last time. So we talked about two kind of key topics. One was just defining a rigid body as as an object where if you break it up into a lot of tiny pieces, the distances between all these pieces um, remain constant. So uh, defining rigid bodies in terms of the distances between different points. And then we also talked about how, how we can specify the configuration of, of a rigid body that's rotating around the fixed axis. So the idea was that if you have a rigid body like that, that's rotating maybe around an axis here, um, all of this object, all of this object is rotating together. So every point on this object is going around the circle and they they all move together right so the 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 change in the angle theta which is enough to tell us where each of these points are uh, all of those changes are the same and therefore there is only one um, one angular velocity omega and one angular acceleration alpha associated with this um, rigid body. So we had omega was d theta dt and alpha was d omega dt. Again, maybe I can review this argument a little bit more. So that's, that's one of the key uh, observations of, of the last lecture. So let's say that's the axis here, and we have one point A on our rigid body. There's, a, let's say, there's another point B on this rigid body. So initially, they can be at different, I mean, they are, in this case, at some different angles, right? So let's say that's theta A for, for this point. This is theta B. And as the body move, rotates around this axis, well, the distances between each of these points and the center of rotation uh, remains constant. So each of these points move on a circle whose radius is the distance between the axis and that point. And because the distance between A, is, a and B is also constant, so a little bit later, you know, this goes over here, this goes over there. And if that distance is the same, this dashed triangle has identical dimensions to the, to the solid triangle here. So if theta A has changed, you know, by some angle, because the ang this angle for the dashed triangle is the same as this angle for the solid triangle. So <clears throat> if theta A kind of moves by some amount, um, theta B must change by the same amount. So that, that was one observation that we have a unique angular uh, velocity and a unique angular acceleration for the entire rigid body that's rotating around the fix, fixed axis. And then we also talked about kind of the kinematic relations uh, between these quantities when alpha is constant, right? So we had constant alpha kinematics. Okay. So let's uh, continue our discussion of, of rigid body dynamics. So let's start with, 
with a question uh, that you can take a look at. So, all right, so take, take a few minutes, pause the video, think about uh, this question for a little bit. So, yeah, I'm back. Uh, so the, the question is saying the fan blade is speeding up. What are the signs of omega and alpha, right? So first, I mean, the, these arrows show the direction of rotation. So the fan, the fan blade is rotating in a clockwise manner. So therefore, our convention was that the counterclockwise direction is positive. So clockwise is negative. So, and that's the direction of the angular um, velocity. So omega is negative. Okay, so omega is a negative number. Now, what about alpha? So it says it's speeding up. So you have a negative number. And if it's going faster, the magnitude of that negative number is getting larger. So maybe initially it's minus two, right? And then when it's going faster in the same direction, maybe it reaches minus five, right? So minus five minus minus two is gonna be minus three. So the change in, in omega is, is also negative. So it seems the correct answer should be D, omega is negative and alpha is negative. And um, yeah, that is indeed the, the correct answer. All right. Now, so when we talk about rigid bodies, each of these objects is, of course, comprised of many, many different point-like particles. So if you break up a rigid body into lots of tiny pieces, you can treat each one as, as, as a point particle, approximately. But it's, it's good to, kind of, to, to associate, uh, let's say, one point to the rigid body. So there is a particular point for any collection of particles, and in particular rigid objects, but also for, for an arbitrary collection of particles, any many-body system. Um, there is a particular point known as the center of mass, which is um, which is a very useful concept. So one property uh, of of the center of mass is is that if there are no let's say external forces on a rigid object, the only thing it can do is to rotate around the center of mass. So the center of mass cannot accelerate uh, if there are no external forces on this object. So I, I will elaborate a bit more on this point. Uh, let's just first define the center of mass. So how is it defined? Well. Uh, I think it's probably more illuminating to switch to the to the whiteboard. So the next topic, or the first topic for today, is the the notion of the center of mass. So we want to build some intuition about this. So suppose you know you have one um, one particle of mass m one and another particle of mass m two. All right, so let's consider a couple of cases. So if m one is equal to m two. We want to define like one point that gives us a center of this collection of masses. It seems natural to say it's somewhere in between, right? And it's, again, if the masses are the same, it actually makes sense to, to think of, of the center uh, to be the center of mass. So maybe if that distance is 
L and this is X reclined. So X is from here to here, from M1 to the center of mass. If the masses are the same, it makes sense that X is L over 2. Let's consider another limit. So if M1 is going to infinity, is it's much larger than M2. So in a more precise way, maybe we can say M1 over M2 is going to infinity. That's a dimensionless number. Generally, when we talk about something being small or large, right, it, it just doesn't make that much sense to talk about something dimension full to be small or large. Um, so, for example, one nanometer, one is not a small number, but that's 10 to the minus 9 meters. And 10 to the minus 9 is small, but they're the same thing. So usually when we say something is small, or something is large, we're comparing two things of the same dimension. And then oftentimes it's convenient to define something dimension less. And then, you know, it makes sense. If something is something dimension less is much larger than, than one, it goes to, I don't know, 10 to the four, 10 to the five. Uh, we're in one limit. If it's much smaller than one again, um, we're in a different limit. So, so in this limit, when kind of M1 is much larger than M2, again, it makes sense that all of the mass or most of the mass is kind of concentrated at M1. So X is going to zero in this case. Uh, this motivates the definition in terms of a weighted average. So, so we want our center of mass to be closer to, to the place where we have more mass intuitively. And, and the definition that, that we come up with is, suppose now you have a collection of masses, maybe M1 here, M2 there, M3 here, maybe M4 over there. And then we, we can pick a coordinate system. So here I'm doing a 2D uh, system. So the masses, I'm assuming, are, are on, a, on a plane, uh, on the xy plane. More generally, you can have these masses in three dimensions. And to each mass, well, I have some vector, right, from the origin of my coordinate system, pointing from the origin of the coordinate system to where that mass is. So let's say that's R1 for mass M1. Or, oops, that's not a line. All right, so let's see if I can draw a better line. So that's R4 going from the origin to M2. I have R2. So this is the x-axis, the y-axis. And similarly for M3, let me move my M3 just for just so the, the lines kind of are not on top of each other. So I draw maybe another R3, and I put M3 here. All right. So the location of the center of mass is defined as, as follows. So R center of mass, the vector from the origin to the center of mass is given by, in this case, M1, R1, plus M2, R2, plus M3, R3, plus M4, R4. And then this clearly does not have dimensions of, of distance, right? R has dimensions of meters, maybe mass kilograms. So we need to divide it by some mass. So we divide it by, by the total mass in the system. So M1 plus M2 plus M3 plus M4. So the center of mass is a point, right? Whose position is given by the weighted averages by the weighted average of the positions of all other all particles in my system. 
and the weight of each vector, the, the weight of R1, is the ratio of the mass at point R1 to the total mass. So that's how, how it's defined. And if you think about coordinates, uh, you can, so R, C, N, um, has an, in two dimensions, it has an X, C, N, times the unit vector um, in the x direction, let's also consider a unit vector in the y direction, plus y c n j direction in the in the y direction. So we can write that vectorial relationship in terms of the components. Okay, so in general, if um, we have n particles. So let's say in this case I had four particles, so n is equal to four. But more generally, let's say I have n different particles. Um, if I break up this equation in terms of the components, I find xcn is sum over, let's say, j equal 1. So j is just a, a dummy summation variable. It's just an index that runs from 1 to n of mj. So again, that runs from m1 to mn times xj, the x coordinate of, of the position of, of particle 1. So just to define these, these xj's and yj's, we can write rj is xj times the unit vector i plus yj times the unit vector j. So the, the j index is just some integer index that labels the particles. It runs from 1 to 4. In this case, more generally, it runs from 1 to n. It has nothing to do with the unit vector j, that's a vector of length 1 in the y direction. And then that's divided by 1 over capital M, where the capital M is just the total mass. So I can write capital M as sum over j equal 1 to n again of mj. Again, in our example, capital M would be this denominator here, m1 plus m2 plus m3, m4. In this case, n is equal to 4. Similarly, ycm, the y coordinate of the center of mass, will be 1 over m, sum over j equal 1 to n, mj, yj. OK. So we can now try to get some practice in finding the center of mass. And then I'll try to motivate this definition a bit more. Um, OK, so, so again, let's review the general formula here. And uh, we can go back to, to the notes. So OK, so let's do one example. We'll do a couple of examples. So example one. Um, consider a dumbbell that has two uh, masses M one. And M2 connected by a massless rod, right? So uh, of length L, of length L. 
So that's what we have. We have mass M1 here. Then there's a rod that doesn't have much mass. It's very light and it's connected to, to another mass M2. And this distance here from one mass to the other is L. And the question is, where is the center of mass of the system of two objects? And we can treat the, the, the two masses, M1 and M2, as, as very small, as point particles. So, <clears throat> so where is the center of mass? So how, how should we proceed? Well, we have this general formula for the coordinates of, of the center of mass in a given coordinate system, right? So to apply that formula, uh, it's helpful to, to specify a coordinate system. And I can do it in multiple ways. I can put, put it in some arbitrary place and maybe have the x-axis going in some arbitrary direction, but there's going to be a choice that's more convenient, make things uh, simpler. So for one thing, if I put the origin on one of the masses, I make, let's say, put it on M1, I make R1 equals zero. That's going to simplify my calculations. Also, if I put one of the axes along the line connecting M1 and M2, again, let's call that the x-axis, all the y-coordinates will be zero. So so I find I don't have to do a separate calculation for the y component. Then it's, it's kind of natural that if you have two points, the center of mass is on the line connecting them somewhere in between. All right, so, so we can pick our coordinate system. Let's say that's the origin, that's the x-axis here. Then here I have m1, here I have m2. So x1 is 0, and x2, the coordinate of m2 in this coordinate system, it's a distance l from the origin, so that's going to be l. Okay, so now the center of mass is going to be somewhere here, so let's say that's my center of mass. Center of mass is a point, right? We're trying to find the coordinates of a, of a point in space. And, well, how do we find it? Well, let's just give a name to its coordinates. We call it XCM. And then we can apply our formula. So XCM is going to be uh, x1 times m1, let me write the general formula, plus x2 times m2, divided by m1 plus m2. So, so x1 is 0, so that's 0, that's nothing. x2 is l, so that becomes l m2 over m1 plus m2. All right, uh, so thinking about what, what this result means a little bit, let's try to, to understand it better. So let's say we have m1 here, m2 here. This whole distance from here to here is L, right? That's our dumbbell. So we found xcm, the coordinate of the center of mass. Uh, remember, in this coordinate system where the origin is at m1 to be l m2 over m1 plus m2. So if the center of mass is over here, let's say, from here to here we have l m2 over m1 plus m2. And then from here to here we have l minus that. So what is the number that, you know, when you add to this you get l? Well, in the numerator here, we have m2. In the denominator, m1 plus m2. So if I subtract here, I, I get m1 over m1 plus m2. You can clearly, you can check easily that these two 
uh, clearly add up to L. Now we can um, check a few things, so some sanity checks, right? So when M1 is equal to M2, these two distances we see are the same. That's quite natural and expected. The center of mass will be right uh, in the middle of the two masses. Uh, we can also think about the limit when one mass is significantly larger than the other one. So let's say if M2 is much larger than M1 plus M2, then, uh, then this distance, so let's say consider the limit, the limit, M2 much larger. So if I put two of these greater than signs, one after the other, it implies that it's, it's a notation that means much larger. Not only it's bigger, but it's much bigger. So in this limit, uh, basically we can neglect that denominator in, in M1. So uh, this distance L M2 M1 plus M2 will be close to L. Right, so in that limit, uh, the center of mass will be very close to M2, and that makes sense. That's where most of the mass is. An extreme limit is if M1 is exactly zero, you just have one point particle, and the center of mass must be where the point particle is. All right, so that was, a, that was an example in one dimension. Let's do, so that was example one, I think. Let's do another example uh, in two dimensions. So example two, again, a collection of point particles, and we're asked to find where the center of mass of this collection of point particles is. So let's say find the coordinates of the center of mass. All right, so we can have like an XY coordinate system. There is a mass of one kg here, one kilogram here at the origin. There is another mass, let's say two kilograms. And this distance, let's say is 10 centimeters. And we have another mass another mass just uh, another mass of uh, let's say three kilograms and this distance is 20 centimeters so what we want to find is x center of mass and y center of mass right where is the center of mass of this collection of three uh, point particles? All right, so we go back to our general formula. So I don't know, we can call this to be M1, this to be M2, this to be M3. So M1 for us is one, M2 is two, M3 is 3. And now that we listed the masses, let's also list where they are. So what is x1, uh, the, the x coordinate of the position of particle 1? So that's 0. It's sitting at the origin right here. Similarly, y1 is 0. For this mass, M2, uh, again, the x coordinate is 0, it's sitting on the y axis, so x2 is 0. y2 is 10 centimeters, or if we want to work in meters, it's 0.1 meters. And then for the last mass, it's sitting on the x axis, so y3 is 0. And 
x3 is 0 0.2, it's 20 centimeters, 0.2 meters. All right, so now we, we kind of collected the information and then we're ready to, um, we're ready to put them into our general formula for, for the center of mass. So let's say xcm is x1 m1 plus x2 m2 plus x3 m3 divided by m1 plus m2 plus m3. So what is that? Well, x1 is 0, x2 is 0, x3 is 0 0.2, 0 0.2 times m3 that's 3 and we want to divide it by the total mass which is 1 plus 2 plus 3 and that's 6 so that's 0.1 meter and then similarly we can find the y coordinate of the center of mass right so again y1 m1 plus y2 m2 plus y3 m3 divided by m1 plus m2 plus m3. What do I get here? So the denominator is again the total mass. That's 6 kilograms. Uh, y1 is 0. y2 is 0.1. So let's just write the one that's not zero. Y2 is 0.1 and it multiplies M2, which is two. And similarly, Y3 is zero. So I get 0.1 divided by three. That's like 0 0.033. So we found where the center of mass of this system of of three particles is. So these problems are pretty straightforward. You can have four particles, you can have five particles. Uh, it's, it's quite straightforward to just identify the coordinates of all the particles and kind of separate x and y, uh, put them into the formula, and then we find where they are. So xcm is going to be somewhere like 10 centimeters. So it's right in the middle here. And y cm is uh, one third, so at like three centimeters and something. So it's somewhere over here. It kind of makes sense. See, on this side you have three kilograms, on this side you have three kilograms. So it makes sense that on the x-axis is halfway in between. Here, on on above this line you have two, below you have four. So it makes sense that this y distance is, is twice. All right, so that was our second example for finding the center of mass. Uh, in cases where we have discrete masses, we have a collection of particles, we know where they are, we want to find their, their center of mass. There is a topic that I want to briefly mention. So. Uh, it's it's not essential for this course. I mean, you can take the center of mass as an, as, as a definition, but it's it's kind of useful to see uh, why this definition is so significant. So um, so consider again a collection of particles. with some external forces acting on them. So let's say I have M1, maybe there's some force F external one acting on this particle. Then I have M2, another particle, there's some other force, F external 2. And then in addition to the external forces, you know, you can have interaction forces between these particles. Maybe they're, they have some mass and there's some gravitational attraction between them. Or maybe they're charged and there's some Coulomb repulsion. There are some internal interaction 
which kind of come, according to Newton's third law, come in pairs, opposite direction, uh, opposite direction equal magnitude. So let's call this F12, call this F21, for example. And then we can have other particles. Let's just, for the sake of the argument, say we have another one and three. There's some other force acting on it. And it similarly has interaction forces with the other particles. So F13, F31, etc. Okay, so So notice that all the interaction forces come in pairs. So if we add all the forces acting on all particles, all the interaction forces cancel out, right? So suppose all the forces acting on particle one are F external one, F12, F13. Uh, for particle three, I have F31, F external three, F32. So when I add those forces, um, all these internal interaction forces cancel out because they come in pairs of opposite signs. So sum of all forces on all particles, the internal ones go away, and this can be written as F external one plus F external two Da, da, da. So it's the sum of all external forces. Now, if you, for each particle, write F is equal ma, the total F is equal ma, uh, for this one we find m1 a1. For this one we find m2 a2, etc. Now here's, here's the magic. So this, let's call it F external net, the vectorial sum of all the external forces acting on this collection of particles. This becomes M, the second derivative with respect to time of, uh, let's say of the position, which can have X, Y, Z coordinates of R1 m1 plus m2 second derivative with respect to time r2 etc so here we see where the definition of the center of mass kind of naturally arises right so <clears throat> so f external net external force becomes the second derivative with respect to time, of m1 r1 plus m2 r2 um, etc. And this is basically the numerator in the definition of the position of the center of mass, right? Remember r center of mass was m1 r1 plus m2 r2 divided by total mass. So we find this quite important equation that says, well, uh, the sum of all the forces is just m, the total mass, times the second derivative of the coordinate of the center of mass, right? So if you multiply both sides of this equation by capital M, you find that M1 R1 plus M2 R2, etc., is RCM times capital. So it's like the center of mass of a collection of point particles acts like, like a point particle of, of the total mass. It has the same acceleration as if all the mass was kind of packed into that one point. And the, the point particles don't even have to be rigid, right? They can have relative motion. Uh, it's, it's, more ge it's completely general. For the case of a rigid body, again, we can kind of assign one point to, 
to this extended object. And if you add all the external forces vectorially acting on this extended object, you can think about the motion as just the center of mass moving as if it was a point particle of the total mass. And then the rest is just some rotation around that center of mass. All right, so this, this discussion here was, was the motivation. It's not, not in the book. It's kind of the motivation of why it's good to define the center of mass this way. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't expect you to, to know all the details of this derivation. It's a little bit above the level of the course, but it's, it was worth mentioning, I think. All right, so, so we got some practice finding the center of mass, uh, getting used to this definition. Now, um, we can try to look into finding the center of mass in, in situations that are a bit more, more involved. So kind of instead of having well-defined point particles, we have kind of a continuous extended object. All right, so that was our definition for a bunch of point particles. And now the, the case we're interested in, or like a, the second case that we're interested in, we have some extended object, you just have a disk or a ball or, or some object where mass is distributed continuously. It's, it doesn't naturally come in separated point-like chunks. You just have some uh, object that's extended and it's a piece of metal, a piece of wood. Uh, there's mass basically to, to very small scales uh, distributed in a continuous way in this, in this extended object. So again, the idea is this, the idea of, of calculus, right? So if we know how to find the center of mass for a bunch of point particles, what's the deal with a point particle? It's just tiny, right? All the mass is localized in a very tiny region of space. So if you have a continuous mass distribution like this over here, well, uh, we can just divide it into tiny pieces. We can just divide it into lots of pieces, right? Lots of cells, and then send the limit of each of those cells becoming smaller, take the limit of each of those cells becoming smaller and smaller. So in that limit, um, each cell behaves like a point particle, right? So then the sum over, remember what we had? We had for, for example, for the x-coordinate of the center of mass, we had a sum over the masses times the coordinates of all of these point particles in the numerator. And, well, if the mass of each tiny, uh, each tiny infinitesimal piece that we divided our, our full object into goes to zero, we, we call it the n, that sum, the limit of that sum becomes just an integral of x, where x is the position of that piece um, divided by, by the total mass. And the integral is, of course, um, taken over the region of space where the object exists. Similarly, we find, an, we find this expression for the for the y coordinate, so that so so the idea that that we integrate over the region of space where the object exists uh, sets the limits of, of integration, and and um, and then dm we kind of have to relate it to infinitesimal distance. Right? We don't know how to take an integral over dm directly. We have to turn it into an integral over dx, dy, etc. Okay, so this is a, a simple example. So it's a rod, thin uniform rod, length L. And we want to find, so mass m. We want to find where the center of mass is. So uniform means the density is the same everywhere, right? So right off the bat, without doing any calculations, uh, our intuition says that, well, it must be right in the middle. I mean, there's what's the difference between right and left, right, if the, the density is uniform? 
All right, so let's see how we can do this. So center of mass of uniform rod. Okay, so we just divide it into little pieces. So I focus on one tiny piece of length dx at distance x from one end. All right, so what is the mass of this tiny piece? I know it has mass, the, the whole rod has mass m length l. So if the density is uniform, the mass is just proportional to the length. So dm, the mass of that tiny piece, is just going to be m over l times dx. In other words, m over l is the linear density. It's mass per length, right? It's a one-dimensional object, so it makes sense to think about the linear density. Uh, mass per length times the length of that little piece, which is dx. Okay, so that's the infinitesimal mass of that tiny piece. All right. So then, xcm, it's a one-dimensional problem, so we only care about the x-coordinate of the center of mass. If we put the x-axis here, let's say that's the zero of the x-axis. This is the origin of it. It's going to be 1 over the total mass integral x dm. And then we have to think about, okay, so we're summing over all the pieces inside this object, right? So I imagine I divide this into lots and lots of little pieces. But where are these pieces? Well, the first one is here at x equals 0. The last one is here at x equals L. And we have pieces all the way in between. So it's going to be an integral from 0 to L. 1 over n, 0 to L, x, m over l, dx. m's cancel out. 1 over l, integral 0 to l, x dx. Integral of x is x squared over 2. from 0 to L, so it gives me L squared over 2 over L is L over 2, as expected. All right, so uh, I think this is a good place to, to stop. So uh, I will post the, the sections that we've been talking about on Canvas so we can also uh, read the uh, relevant sections in the book.